Well, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very, very happy to introduce Anne. Um, you know, I grew up watching, you know, all, all her work, and uh, not that I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, we're almost the same age. Um, she, uh, you know, uh, was nominated, as you all probably know, for an Oscar and, uh, and a BAFTA and a Golden Globe winner for Shortcuts, one of my very favorite movies. And she has been in some of my very favorite movies. She's, you know, been in over 40 films. And um, she is also, uh, an, uh, in addition to being an Academy Award nominated actress, a human rights advocate. And she's fought for human rights in nearly two decades, and she's the founder and international spokesperson for Artists for Human Rights. I'm going to be asking her about her career and her work and taking your questions. So let's give a warm applause to Anne Archer. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Nice to see all of you. <laughs> this yes. is great. So, um, you know, we're going to ask lots of questions, and you guys can ask lots of questions. But uh, I always am fascinated by process and, uh, you know, how people started the beginning of their career. You know, what was that, that moment when you knew you wanted to act? What happened? So I guess I'm going to ask you, what, what started it all? Well, um, my mother and father were both actors, so I grew up in the industry, especially theater actors. My mother was on Broadway at 16, and, um, and then she became famous for this show called The Danny Thomas Show, or Make Room for Daddy, and um, <clears throat> was a, a real household name for about a decade. And uh, my father acted in White Heat, actually, uh, played the bad guy in White Heat. So, oh. so I grew up with it, and there were always theater people around our house. And um, I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. <clears throat> but I was interested in all aspects of the art, dancing, singing. Um, we, I would put on shows with my girlfriend all the time. So it started at a very early age. Yeah. Great. Well, I, I knew that your parents were actors, and uh, but I didn't realize how much in the theater. Yeah, and so maybe mm -hmm. that you know explains yeah, your love for the yeah. theater, as we will. So you had you played some incredible roles. I mean, I remember seeing Fatal Attraction and thinking how that changed the behavior of men for what <laughs> at least two decades. Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> One thing, would hope. <laughs> men never had affairs on their wives the same way again, ever. <laughs> um, what, um, you know, what, how did you uh, get cast uh, as, uh, as a well, character? It's interesting because um, I had actually auditioned for the director, Adrian Lyne, for nine and a half weeks. And I almost got it, you know, but I didn't. So, but he, he liked me, he was very aware of me. So when he was looking for someone to play Beth in Fatal Attraction, um, my agents actually, you know, set up uh, this audition and Sherry Lansing, who was head of the studio, really liked me. And so I had that going in uh, to the audition, but it wasn't a sure thing at all um, because he was seeing a lot of different gals, a lot of different women. And um, so that's how I got the audition. But you know, it's really funny what I say now looking back is I did a great audition and then we, I improvised um, a whole little section of it at the end, which I found out he really loved. I found out after he told me this. And then the other thing is he commented on my outfit and the way I looked and how tan my legs were and my sandals. <laughs> And I realized that I also wore the right outfit. <laughs> and I hate to tell you, but you know, pardon my French, S-H-I-T like that happens. And sometimes that's what gets you the role. It, it was really stupid. But I, if I had worn pants or something and, and a tank top, it might have been different. But I just looked like Beth to him the way I walked in the room. So there you go. 
Also, I think what's really interesting is when you audition for something and you don't get it, mm -hmm. it's you're dropping your calling card for a future project yeah. in the yeah. future. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, well, so what in, impact, I mean, I just went for like the big, you know, fatal attraction question, but what impact did this role and, and the success of this movie have in your life? Well, it changed everything. Um, I, I was a working actress. I was working all the time, but not known. And it definitely put me on the map with, without question. And, um, you know, it's, I, I'm not someone to um, rely on or hang on past successes. I tend to like move on, you know, move forward. That was great. Now let's move forward. And, uh, but people won't won't let me <laughs> which is a beautiful thing that means that that role and that that movie had such an impact that it lives on to this day and uh, people ask me about it constantly I, I, I it becomes your moniker most actors have a film that is kind of their moniker um, and uh, I, you know I'm very proud of it it it's a film that not only was good but it really did shock and stir things up and had something to say mm -hmm. I always used to say when all the press that we did, you know, prior and after the film came out, I'd get these <laughs> these male interviewers, and they would say, I'd always know how they felt about fidelity because they would say, boy, it just made me want to go home and hug my wife and kids. Or they'd say, don't you think that was a little hard punishment for a guy? <laughs> and I'd know everything about them. <laughs> I could bust them, you know. <laughs> How did you feel about the ending and the whole? Uh, well, we shot two endings. Two endings, right. right. Um, the first one um, I loved. Uh, it, it really was rich for me as an actress because I, a lot of you may have seen the original ending because you can see both of them. Um, they take uh, Michael away, the police take Michael away, and I run up to the attic and he says to call his lawyer. And I'm trying to call his lawyer and I see um, a, a, back then it was a cassette. I actually used cassettes and it said, play me, Alex, which was obviously Glenn Close's character's name. And while I'm waiting and the phone's ringing, and I put it in the cassette player. And she basically says, if you don't come through for me, I'll kill myself. And of course, he's accused of killing her. So I realize I have the evidence to save his life. And I run down the stairs and call for my daughter and run out the door. It was a really nice kind of emotional moment. And I actually was in Paris um, uh, on a holiday, I think, actually, um, before the movie came out. And I got a call from uh, one of our producers, Stanley Jaffe, saying they were going to reshoot the ending. And I thought. I kind of thought with the ending it might be an Academy Award nomination for me because it was very rich and I burst into tears. And then I settled down and he said, no, it's, it, it doesn't test well. They want to see you get your revenge. And so then eventually I saw the new ending and um, I read the new ending and it was action. You know, it, it didn't have acting moments, you know. I put the you know, gun to her and all that. And, and, and I thought, oh. well, I was so wrong. I mean, it turned out to be so you know, tense and, and, and strong as an ending. And for me too, and for, for Glenn, and for Michael, for everybody, that without question, the movie is as big a hit as it's been because we redid the ending. That's great. Yeah. And so, um, and so before that, like you said, you were working, you were a working actress, and did you go to school for acting? You studied? I, I, I took a theater arts major at Scripps College because my parents insisted I get a college degree. I had really no interest in it. I just wanted to act, but I knew that I had to do that. And um, while I was in college, in my last year, I was in a play, and uh, someone, uh, uh, a brother of a friend of a friend came to see me in it uh, and he then sent an agent to see me in the play and I got an agent before I graduated. And then eight months after I graduated from college, um, I got an audition for a big film at Paramount. What was it? God, I'm trying to remember now. I think it was no, it was Warner Brothers, and um, 
It was a John Voight's first film after he did Midnight Cowboy, and it wasn't a success. The film wasn't a success, but I got this huge role. Now, that film had been a success. It would have started for me earlier, but I, it was a beautiful role, and, um, and I know you're gonna ask me the name of it, and you think I could remember, but uh, it will come to me. I can't think of it right now. That's, that's how much it didn't make an impact. <laughs> Anyway, uh, and so I, I mean, I was really a working actress. I just, and then I did a lot of television, and I, I thought, oh, television, I only want to do movies. Back then, you, you either did movies or you did television, and there was kind of a differentiation. Um, but you know, I look back at some of the television I did, and I, and I think, oh, I bet I was terrible. And I go, gee, I was pretty good. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of surprised, and it worked for me, so it was good. Um, what, what of all the roles you've played, what is your favorite one? Do you have a favorite one or favorites, plural, or? Well, it's really hard to um, not say Fatal Attraction because it brought me so many, you know, such wonderful things in my life and it is a good movie and it was a really fun role. I mean, I've had other successful movies and the roles were great. Um, so I can't, I can't say in I'd have to say Fatal Attraction actually would, but in terms of a favorite, favorite role, it's actually been in the theater where um, my husband wrote a piece about Jane Fonda and her uh, activism during the Vietnam War and uh, turned it into a play. We workshopped it at your theater yeah. at the Edgemar, then we took it to the Edinburgh uh, Festival, and then we took it to London in 2000. 16, eight, eight, I can't remember, maybe 17, and it won Best New Play um, uh, in London, and it's really good, and then we're making our way, we're gonna go to New York, so. And that's a really fantastic role. Yeah. I, I play Jane, you know, she was, she was in her 50s at that time, and so I, I'm cheating, I'm playing her. <laughs> <laughs> well, we believed it for sure. <laughs> yeah. What, um, the theater, what about, I mean, the theater we all know is, is hard, and it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, Anne and I are rehearsing right now uh, a play. There's nothing more difficult than a one-woman show, and it's based on uh, a memoir by uh, Norris Church Mailer, who was uh, the, the fifth wife? The sixth wife. Sixth wife, sixth wife of Norman Mailer. And, um, and there's a, this one-woman show it was adapted from this memoir and uh, by Bonnie Culver, this wonderful writer, and, uh, and, and said, I'm going to do it. And it was so, so yes, difficult. Yes, ma'am. I'm <laughs> so thrilled. Yeah. And it's so <laughs> difficult because there's nothing harder than a one-woman show. I mean, um, so, you know, you, you must love, love the theater, and I love the theater. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course, we're in a town where, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> People. Well, I, I'm more and more, you know, as you get older, it's harder and harder to get film roles that mean anything that you, you know, you really care about doing. And the theater offers you, you know, you know a lot of riches in that area. And so um, that's why I'm doing it also. I like telling the story from beginning to end. It's really fun to immerse yourself in a character and tell the whole story in one night. I do enjoy that. It is really hard work. It's... Um, and you know, you say you're gonna do it for three months and then you wish you hadn't said you were gonna do it that long. And then you get to the last three weeks and you're counting every night, you know. The, and it, it, it's a commitment. And then you're not willing to jump in and do it again right away. You need a little breather and then you miss it and you wanna do it again. Um, and uh, I think the reason that um, I was able to confront doing this play with you, which is over an hour and something long, and it's just me, so there's no one to bounce off of if I go up, and that is really scary. But in the Fonda play, I had these really long sequences, and if, if I hadn't done the Fonda play, I don't think I would be able to confront this, but because I've done that, I'm willing to do this, and frankly, we're in the early stages of rehearsal, and I am scared to death, so. That just goes with the territory. But I think they yeah, exactly <laughs> goes with the territory. And I also yeah. think it's a good thing. Yeah, it it's is a good, good thing. thing. It really to, scares me. To it's be scared. <laughs> but you did say I, that you, um, theater, uh, I don't know if you said that exact quote, but uh, you know, th it's the only place where you can really, really grow as an actor. Yes, yes. And I've heard a lot of theater actors say this. Every night 
you try and make it the best you can. And at the end of the show, you say, just, oh, it was good tonight. Oh, I missed it tonight. And you try and get better every night. And by doing theater, you grow as an actor more than in any other form. So I feel that um, actors who are up and coming and, and are having and want to have career on film um, don't forget the theater because that's where you're going to get a chance to really become great. I absolutely agree. I think that that is just a chance to deepen your mm -hmm. instrument because mm -hmm. every night you have a chance to go deeper with it mm -hmm. and that follows you into your work. You know, that's absolutely. work that, you know, it's you muscle. own. It's yeah, muscle. It's muscle. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what yeah. it is. Yeah. So you got a big toolbox then. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I know as scary as it is, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's it's a challenge for yourself. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah. you keep raising the bar yeah. and I think that ultimately a lot of actors that do tons of films at some point, they're confronted with, mm -hmm. you know, these offers of going to New York and, you know, raising the bar and doing theater. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's... Uh, it's exciting. It's, it's, it's really exciting. exciting. Yeah, I love <laughs> the fact that we're having this experience and, yeah. uh, and I love theater. I get there every chance I can. Um, how, when you get, approach a role uh, in film or, or on stage, what is your process? What do you, what do you do? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. It probably changes a little bit with each, each project. But um, I, obviously, the the thing I've never been able to stop myself from doing is when I first read it, I immediately start acting it. You know, I'll talk. Blah, 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 blah. And um, I haven't done a lot of homework yet, but it's very, it's irresistible. I don't know that it's wrong. Your first instincts are more than often your best instincts. And then, then I start doing the research. I, I read everything I can. If there, there is research available, like playing Fonda, um, uh, I can't say that I did research for something like Fatal Attraction. I mean, we all know what that feels like to be cheated on and what I mean that was that was easier to draw from um, but I do as much research I can on either the time period the character the actual incidents that happen whatever is available so that I can uh, and I've learned over the years that well now do I have to think about all that research I did and and think about this thing that when you're act acting it no you do it and it is in there you just just then be in the moment with what's going on and that research is there and it pays off. You don't have to work at what you researched. It will then get in your way if you try and do that. So I've learned that over time. Like I've done a lot of research on Norris Church Mailer and I love it, but now she's already inside of me and now I can just let it go and just talk about what she's talking about in the moment. And I think one of the things that you went after was immediately you know, wrapping your head around how does she speak? You yeah. know, what's her dialect? Mm -hmm. And yeah, when you have to do a dialect, now I did a lot of work on Fonda because Fonda has a particular way of speaking too, even though, you know, she's pretty close to me. Um, I haven't had to use, yes, I take that back. I've had to do Bronx accents on film, um, lots of fun. Uh, yeah, I, I, I always work with a good dialect coach and and do it every day and talk like that a lot so you're not thinking about how you sound and but when you when you start to act the role it it's there without any effort yeah no that's great i think that's that's a wonderful way in mm -hmm. to really understand how mm -hmm. the character speaks mm -hmm. how they walk mm -hmm. uh, things you all learn in acting classes you know how, how, what's what's interesting about that character's walk or how does the way he, he or she dresses affect you, um, habits, all those things, smoking, glasses, uh, hands, everything that you know you can find with that character that makes it more, if it's someone in real life then you have to study them and if it's someone you're making up you want to look for lots of interesting colors. Is, um, do you feel that something has changed in your process of how to approach a role? Are there things that are just ingrained in you in terms of maybe breaking down a script that just comes to you? Or um, do you feel that like you're working? I mean, like you said, it depends on what role, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. what it is. Like, for instance, with this, there's a lot of, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but do you, do you find that anything has changed in how you, you work and how you break it down? 
I, I'm probably more thorough and ambitious about it than I was maybe when I was younger. Um, just because I've experienced the riches of it. Theater's, again, been the major um, teaching tool for me to, to do that. Um, and uh, it, then it carries over into film. Uh, the thing about film sometimes is you get cast so quickly and then you have to go to work so quickly. Um, you know, you just got to get it up there right away. Sometimes there isn't time to do the work that you might otherwise do, but I can't really say I complain about that. It, your, I still say your first instincts are usually your best. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, I believe that. That's mm -hmm. absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I yeah. always, yeah. you know. Yeah, you start messing around with it and you start thinking it through too much and fiddling with it and you lose the thing that made it rich. Now you're off on something else. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree 100%. Um, well, we talked about theater. <laughs> we <laughs> talked about um, what is the role that you still would like to play? What? Yeah, it's, uh, people, uh, I ask always get that. asked that question, and, and, you know, I wish I had a great answer, but I've noticed, you know, you have to take into consideration where you are in your life, the age you're at, the blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I'm, I would like to play powerful women um, that are smart and, and, you know, have something to say, make a difference. Well, why wouldn't I? I mean, that's the, uh, and, and uh, you know, people like, I don't know, Hillary Clinton, Samantha Powers, who is a very famous human rights activist, an amazing woman. Uh, they're great stories, a story could be told about her. Um, characters like that interests me a lot. Um, and then, and then a very dark character, someone who's pure evil. I've never played anyone who's <laughs> pure evil. And when you can really, when you have the luxury and the permission to really play that, that could, that could be a really fun experience. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I studied with Stella Adler, and she said that every actor has like two hundred characters in them that they could play. I always remember that. I heard that when I was oh, really I like young, that. and I started to think about all the 200 characters yeah. that, that I could play. Yeah. Um, what, of all the roles you've played, what was the one that you feel was the hardest one? Oh, um, I, I probably, and again, as a theater, probably Fonda, and, and now this at this point. In film, which was the hardest? I don't know that there is one that I'd say I was really, you know what, what makes a part hard is when the script's not good. And um, sometimes I remember doing, I won't name it, but uh, when Showtime first came on the scene and was a big deal, I did this Showtime piece and the script was so friggin' all over the place and didn't make sense. Um, to find her and really play a through line that was really believable and rich was very, very difficult. And, and, and unfortunately, we had a director who, I don't know what planet he was on, but he wasn't on the same one I was on. And uh, that, that, that was the toughest experience I've ever had. And we were on a schedule, and the last three or four days, we were shooting these long hours, and the last day we shot all night. And I had lots of talking, so you're not getting any sleep. So that's very hard. That's very hard. How much does improvisation, how much has improvisation played a part in your work on film? It depends on the piece and the director and what's required or needed of the piece. Um, so you don't often get to improvise that much. Um, it really depends on the director. Uh, the film I did with Robert Altman, Shortcuts, I mean, you know, he's the king of improvisation. And he would set up scenes like a party scene and um, we'd each kind of have our viewpoint and then <clears throat> we'd rehearse it, it was all improv. And then when he liked what was happening, the body of it, then he would film it. So in a way, we were writing the scene while we were improv it and then he would shoot that. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> that was really, fun for me and fun for all of us because you really got to find crazy kooky things in your character and you got to go really get out there and try stuff. So I would say 
And most actors loved working with Altman. Most people would say of my generation that he's one of their favorite directors. He's one of my favorite directors, for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. um, so th that is like the most memorable experience with him of improvisation and yes. he probably was the... And I, and, and I remember um, a moment, I don't know why I never forgot it or why it hit me, but I, I had to take a, a shot of whiskey standing on the stairs and so we rehearsed it and, and I took the shot and he came, I drank the shot and he came up to me afterward and he said, I liked the way you your mouth, that was really great. Do that, you know, and I thought, I didn't even know I did that. And uh, I thought, yeah, he sees something in the character with that behavior that he likes, <clears throat> and it kind of <clears throat> set up um, my character a little bit for me. Just that one moment of, of where she goes and what happens to her, it kind of was the indicator, and it was great. So, you know, a good director will do that. Yeah, they'll mm -hmm. give you a key in, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, well, before I, I'm gonna, I know you guys have a lot of questions. I already have some in my hands. Um, do, can you tell us a little bit about um, your work uh, with, um, you know, Artists for Human Rights? Uh, yes, I can. I wanted to tell you one story, though, because you, you ask a question, what was the funniest thing that ever happened? When you told me one of the questions you were going to yeah. ask me, funniest or surprising moments mm -hmm. ever, I, I do want to tell that story because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, shooting this film called uh, Narrow Margin with Gene Hackman, and it was all on a train up in the, in the um, Rocky Mountains, Canadian Rockies. And... Um, uh, there was a sequel, uh, and some of you have probably seen the film, you have to, you're standing on top of the train and it goes through tunnels and it was, it, I wasn't a stunt girl and it was very scary and um, they at one point wanted me to crawl up on top of the train, this is the first time I was asked and um, I said, well, you I mean, why, how will I, while it's moving, how will I be safe and what will you do when you don't have a stunt person? And they said, it's all right, never mind, never mind. Gene's doing it. And so like, okay, Gene, who was a lot older than I, was climbing up on top of the train. So then I felt the pressure. Oh so I did it. And there are actually two interesting parts of the story. So then when we get to the, the promo for the movie, um, and we're doing the um, videos, you know, for all the promotion. And Gene and I are in the green room. This is now six months later. And, um, you know, I, I, somehow we started talking about it. And he said, is that what happened? He said, I did it because they told me you were going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I found out. But, but the really interesting thing is there's a sequence where I have to hang off the side of the train. And I'm, they're filming all day. I'm sitting in my trailer. I haven't worked at all. It's getting toward the end of the day. Finally, they say, okay, we're going to do it. We put, we, we're putting you in this harness, and you'll be hanging from a harness. And then we'll start the train, and we'll start going. And I said, okay. I said, have you tested this on anyone, <laughs> on the stunt person? He looked at me, and he went, that's a wrap. <laughs> oh because he knew it would take too much time to to test it and then get me. So I, I didn't understand all that. It was a very innocent question. And so they sent me home and then they put a double in it and tested it and she dislocated her arm. Oh my God. So I've been very careful with stunts ever since then to make sure I ask the right questions. I've had a couple things like that happen, getting shot with a bullet where the padding's not right and I'm all black and blue, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you, you have to be smart, but it kind of amused me that uh, they wanted to get their shot in, so they were gonna go ahead and try it with me without ever testing it on somebody else. So, there you go. Those are good <laughs> stories and really, really good advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you really have to take care of yourself, and, yeah, you and one of the ways to take care of yourself is asking questions. And more and so uh, these days, because there's a lot of required of uh, actresses that never used to be required in terms of physicality, and, and for guys too, and you just have to be careful. 
and protect yourself. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I was, uh, you know, just finished shooting a movie and there was, we were shooting by a pool and there was, you know, the, the, well, who was there? Somebody here was there, you were there. The water of the pool came up and people were slipping and I was like, oh my God, I was like running around trying, like, no, 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 you can't be there. I mean, sets can be dangerous. Yeah, I yeah, mean, and, and, and a good AD is very careful about that and a good stunt person is too. And I don't want to disparage them because usually they're very, very good, but you have to use your own common sense as well. Um, before talking about you know the, the humanitarian, who of all the actors and actresses that you've worked with, what, what was like your favorite co-star? Well, yeah. I've really been lucky. I've really worked with at that in, from my generation incredible all the great actors. Stars. Yeah. yeah, Harrison Ford and, and Gene Hackman and Michael yeah. Douglas and yeah, even Sylvester Stallone, his second movie after um, after the Rocky yeah. film, um, yeah. Yeah, Tommy Lee Jones, a lot, lot of, uh, who was my favorite? Uh, it's hard to say. I, I really love Gene Hackman because I learned a lot about acting from him. He's very improvisational. And um, he didn't like to rehearse much, which was okay. I thought it was interesting. He was really good. And he, I, I learned something about relaxation from watching him work. Um, Fun to work with Michael Douglas. He was such a cutie, you know, without question. I think I had a big crush on him. Um, <laughs> Harrison, same thing. Um, uh, in terms of an acting experience, they were, I gotta say, funnily, and, oh, uh, no, Donald Sutherland. I did a film in Poland with Donald Sutherland. Wow, what an actor. He was um, an amazing actor to spend a lot of time with. Uh, he's so smart. And um, I just learned a lot about everything just being around him. It was really, really great. So, I, yeah, I, I can't, I've had wonderful experiences with almost, I've never, no, there's one I didn't, but otherwise I've had a good experience with every actor I've ever worked with. <laughs> just want to ask like a technical question because you know there's so much waiting when you're on a set, when you're shooting, mm -hmm. and you have to be so patient all the time. And, and they say, what do they say? They don't pay you to act, they pay you to wait, really. Mm -hmm. um, so when you've waited, you know, countless hours, and now it's time to shoot that scene that you have to show up, what are some good tools, do you think, that were helpful to you to get yourself in the zone to go in and? It's really hard because if you work and prepare too much and then you wait all day, you've kind of <clears throat> worn yourself out and, and uh, taken the heat away from it sometimes. Uh, and then if you, leave it alone too much, you feel, <gasps> and you're not, you know, you're not feeling quite juicy enough, but um, that's where your toolbox is very important. That's where all the acting you've done pays off, and your experience pays off, because you'll find you can just jump right into something, and it's much easier. You don't have to work so hard at it. But for emotional scenes, um, there is, there is a timing thing. Sometimes I would ask, so what are we looking at? When are we likely to get to that? And, you know, if I know we're getting close, I'll, you know, I'll say, look, um, before you send me into makeup and hair, give me about 10, 15, 20 minutes or something before you send me back into makeup and hair because we're getting ready. So I have a little time by myself. Sometimes I'll do that. It varies with every single project because the need is different in anything right. you do, it's never exactly the same. So I just, sometimes they just don't give you any time and you just go and it's the best you've ever been and everything's fresh and there and it's rich and full and you go, well, I don't know where that came from, but I was ready. So there, there's like a, a sense of having to understand about you, wherever you are in your life in that project and how to take care of yourself and manage, you know, your your instruments, your nervous yeah. system, right? Yeah. It's there's a lot of like, um, you know, really understanding what works for you. Yeah. In that moment. Yeah, and it can change. It can change because of the kind of environment on the set, because of the director, because of the nature of the scene. It it, you just have to follow your instincts as an actor and go with what you feel you need in that moment. Do you like better to have rehearsed the scene? and or um or less rehearsal or it depends on the project it depends on there's some 
scenes you need to rehearse because there's a lot of either a lot of dialogue a lot of has to have a, a great pace to it and you you need to find it and then maybe you leave it alone for a while so you're you know maybe you're rehearsing with the actor or something and then there are other scenes that you don't you don't want to rehearse them too much because it, the heat will go out of it and it doesn't require it um, so I don't have again it, I go project by project and scene by scene in terms of what's needed. Uh, sometimes I feel, let's, let's not work this thing too much. And sometimes I go, would you run this with me? Let's do this. Let's, and the director will say, okay, we really need to you know, time this out and work it because it's an intricate, complicated scene. It sort of depends. Um, let's talk about your, your humanitarian work. And uh, yeah, about ten, 2006, I started an organization called Artists for Human Rights. Um, I don't know, the human rights issue just hit me square in the middle of my head. Um, it's always been there since I was a little tiny girl. I saw, um, I saw footage when I was six years old, I shouldn't have seen it, of Auschwitz and all the bodies being thrown into the graves. And it was so shocking to me the inhumanity of man to man that that could ever happen. That uh, it made me, it scared me and it made me really angry. And you know, it sat there all my life. And then there's been so much more, we're, what's going on in the world is so much closer to us because of the internet and television that these things that seem so far away are in my face, in our faces. and. Um, it's just wrong, and, and, and I felt so strongly about it. So I've always said that artists uh, can change hearts and minds overnight. You could have a prejudice about a particular, um, you know, country, ethnicity, people, issue, and you tell a wonderful story about those people, and someone who either had no understanding or had a strong prejudice about something will have a change of heart from film or be so much more educated about it they they slowly come to have greater understanding so um, I felt that artists have a responsibility to to tell these stories and uh, and we see it a lot now from when I started in 2006 there weren't a lot of films that were telling stories about human rights issues but they're all around us all the time now, thank God, and they are changing hearts and minds, and people are getting greater understanding of, of all the various issues going on in the world today and the human rights abuses that are happening today. And um, so we started this organization with two other girlfriends of mine, and uh, we'll put on events. We, we started off thinking, how are we going to get people to come to learn about what's going in on in South Sudan where these two tribes are slaughtering each other and, you know, where they've had war forever and over 250,000 people died. That was one of the ones we started. Who's going to come to that? So we decided to call it a salon and we got John Bull Dow, who wrote this wonderful book, um, about escaping that and walking at 14 years old, 1,200 miles to another area, blah, blah. And everybody came. And so we started doing those, and we've had amazing speakers. We've, you know, had uh, all kinds of human rights activists and just major things. And Carrie Kennedy came and talked to us from her organization and um, members of the United Nations, blah, blah, blah. Nobel Peace Prize winners. And then we started really trying to support certain, certain organizations and we took, um, there is a, an organization called Voices for Freedom which frees in, um, in India uh, generational slavery, entire villages, and we supported an entire village and freed that village. And then when all the refugees were arriving onto Lesbos, the island of Greece, and it's still going on. We raised money for one of the camps there, and we're about to do an event in the fall on um, jail reform and uh, social justice with two amazing organizations that are doing amazing work here. So, uh, yeah, it's become my passion. You know, if you don't get to act all the time, too, you have to find out what your passion is, and it's really my passion. I, I really hope we're making a difference, and anything any of us can do is important. So, and then my, oh, thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you. And then my husband wrote this film about, you know, the Vietnam War and, and Jane trying to stop the war and she was so maligned and he's written this brilliant, uh, he wrote this play and he's also written as a film and then he wrote a, a, a book and now we're doing a play on the Iraq War and George W. Bush's responsibility for that, blah, blah, blah. So we're constantly um, in the theater trying to create product that has a really important human rights message. That's great. Oh, Thank that's you. fantastic. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Um, well, before I open up to your questions, I have to ask one question. I, when, I, um, when we had coffee, I can't remember when it was, but it was in the summer, right? Mm -hmm. when, when I approached you to mm -hmm. do the play. And I was just staring, I was thinking, boy, Anne looks great. You're probably, well, you know, what, um, how do you, you know, keep looking so great? What are your secrets? Mm, that's so sweet. People often say that to me. I think I'm blessed because my mother was very, very beautiful. And she was beautiful till the day she died. So, I mean, so, so strikingly attractive without doing anything to her face. It was before people did that sort of thing. And, um, she was so attractive that there wasn't anyone who didn't comment on it for, yes, yeah, she had wrinkles and all that, but she, she just had beautiful bone structure and she was so attractive and always very slender, just, just the way she was. And, and uh, I think I just have her genes is what it is because I don't think I do anything different uh, in terms of caring for myself than most people do. I'm not a huge exercise person. I try and do what I can. I do Pilates, you know, I walk. Um, when I was younger, I took big hikes. I don't do that quite as ambitiously as I used to, but, and you know, I take the proper care. I get facials, I do all those things, get my hair cut, you know. I do all the things that girls do to try and look nice, but um, yeah, I, I just, I, I eat pretty healthily because my husband is really good about food and it helps me and I've, you know, I've weaned myself off the bad stuff. I think that helps, but um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just lucky. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I have some questions from you guys here. Um, let's see. Um, what is your advice for, uh, for a beginning actor? Um, wow. <laughs> the, the, if I were doing it all over again, and I guess that would be my advice, I would go to New York and try and work in the theater, and I'd, I'd study, and um, I, I feel that's, a lot of your great actors today have a very interesting theater background. There are those that don't, but many of them do. And uh, that will, again, as we talked about, build muscle and strength. So, yeah, and you need to study, study with a good teacher. But you know what? No, you know what the most important thing is to do? Don't just try and be an actor. Today, you have to figure out how you're going to create your own product. So, you know, make a little movie and put it up, you know, Put it on the internet. Put, put, your, put it on YouTube. Um, get with friends and create product. And mainly just work, 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 act, act, act. And don't just worry about acting. Learn about cinematography. Learn about writing. Try and write. Write something for yourself. Learn how to direct. It's going to pay off someday. And that's, I think, where a lot of actors are getting a lot of attention because they, they're doing that m more and more. And, and now it's so easy. When I was young, it was impossible. I mean, I, you know, you had big cameras and, you know, you, you couldn't, there wasn't an internet. You couldn't do things like that. So you had to get some studio or production company to cast you in something so that you could get your work seen. It was imp and you couldn't even do an independent film. My husband and I did do an independent film when we first got married that we raised all the money for ourselves. I think we raised $2 million, which was a lot then. Which one was it? Uh, Waltz Across Texas. <laughs> That's a great old, and um, he comes from Texas and it was about, you know, it was an oil town. It was about, you know, a young geologist girl and an, an, a land man. And it was a romantic comedy. Anyway, we shot it in Texas. We raised all the money. We didn't have a distributor. It was very hard to get a distributor. It was an okay film. We got a lovely director. I'm not saying, um, that we didn't do it, but my husband came from seven Emmys already working for ABC Sports, so he knew quite a bit about 
getting film made and doing things of that nature. But uh, it's not so hard today. You can, for no money, you can just put something up. And I think along with studying that actors should be creating their own product. Yeah, no, I think it's great advice. Mm -hmm. I always say that, absolutely. Um, so this question is from Dylan. How do you see yourself when you see yourself on screen? I try not to look at myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, when I was younger, sometimes I would see something, oh, wow, that turned out great, that's good. And other times I'd go, oh, no, oh, dear. And then um, I was always nervous when I'd have to see it. Um, my generation looks were a much bigger deal than they are today, and sometimes I didn't think I looked very good. I wasn't, lighting was such a big issue then because of the kind of equipment and cameras, and if you didn't have a good cinematographer and you weren't lit well, um, sometimes you didn't look very good. So I had an awareness of all those things. And then as I got older, I, I hate seeing myself on film because, you know, I'm an older person and I look a lot older on film because it exposes everything. And um, so I, I, I look, I look, but I can also not even watch something. And I, I'm, once I've shot it, I'm kind of done. <clears throat> but sometimes I have to look at something and I do, I don't mean I fight it, but I, 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 I've gone through various things over the years of wanting to see myself, not wanting to see myself, um, is it, do I have a responsibility to? Will it help me? Does it hurt me? Does it make me more self-conscious? Um, I did learn some things early on. I uh, uh, used my mouth too much, a lot, on, in film, and I had to learn not to do that so much. Um, so that was valuable, but I don't have a thing about it. Right. Okay. And then here I have another question that says, what is your challenge and difficulties in this industry? Uh, the same challenge all actors have, getting a good job. You know, sometimes you can get a bad job, but getting a good job, something you, you're willing to, you know, put your guts into, it's hard. There's, there's never, you know, and as you get older, it's much, much harder. So, um, yeah, the biggest challenge is, is getting work, getting cast. Yeah. Have you, when you have gotten scenes that, um, you know, we're not like exactly the writing that you wanted it to be. Have you rewritten the scene and gone up to the director? Uh, I, I, I have. Um, yes, I have. Probably not in, in major, major stuff on film. I mean, we're doing that now with this play. We're moving things around and, we're moving around. and getting rid of stuff. And I mean, and I certainly did it in the Fonda play extensively. But on film, maybe it's just a line or two or a sequence that I feel uh, needs to make more sense. And I find it's usually pretty successful. Usually the, the help is really appreciated. So. I just think it's such a, for me, you know, with actors, it's such a wonderful interpretive art. And I have found that as good as the script has been, and the last few projects I've directed have been great scripts, but when an actor comes up and, and then they offer another line, for a line that's already well written, um, it's interesting because most of the time it's worked better. Mm -hmm. Even though the line was good to begin with, there was just something about, you know, the actor taking the writing and saying, I'm going to make it my own. Mm -hmm. and he feels it, or she feels yeah. it. Yeah. And that's why it's better, because it comes out better, because it's, it's in their gut. Absolutely, mm -hmm. it's in their gut. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have never, um, I've never said no. Mm -hmm. I've never gotten attached so much mm -hmm. to the lines that were there mm -hmm. that I have said no to an actor that came because it's something, mm -hmm. you know, from the gut. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great thing to do when you're looking at the scene that you're about to shoot, mm -hmm. to really go into your gut mm -hmm. and see, you know, if the lines are going to come out really, truly, organically mm -hmm. out of you. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's another line that comes out and maybe that's the line that's meant to be. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very true. Has there ever been a role that you've done that completely took you out of your comfort zone? Something that, I mean, I know that these theater pieces are difficult and yeah, I think it's definitely I think, out of the comfort zone. But well, I think the one film where the script was such a mess and the director was definitely out of my comfort zone, was it the story? The story had a big lie in it and that made it hard to play because it had no logic, and that, that's always very hard. So that was definitely out of my comfort zone. 
Um, no, I, I, I like doing accents, so that's a little out of my comfort zone, but it's also kind of the most fun thing, too. So, yeah, I would say. What do you find most difficult about being on set? What is? Waiting around. It's the waiting, right? Uh -huh. It's the waiting. And how many times have you thought that you were going to shoot something, and then you never ended up shooting it on that day? Mm, probably pretty frequently. You just don't get to it, and then it gets pushed. And sometimes it just gets cut, too. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I, I was working with some actors a couple of movies ago that were so scared when the scenes were on the schedule and did not make it yeah. that eventually they would be cut. That yeah, was in low a fear. budget films, that's definitely a risk because you just don't fear. have the money. Yeah. In a big studio film, you know, if it's if it's not going to be shot, it's not going to be shot for a good reason. I, actually, there is an interesting story on Fatal Attraction because I had a scene in the script which was a love scene between Michael Douglas and me that was a nude scene. And they had shot Glenn's, you know, big sex scene with Michael and, and the knife, I think, or something. They'd shot some of that. And the producers came to me and they said, you know what, we, we're not going to shoot that scene. You are too likable and um, it's going to make it hard for us to sell our story. If you're, you're too pretty and you're too likable and it's just going to be really hard to sell. And, and in the scene, it's a nice scene between us where it's really loving, like we're really having great sex as opposed to the guy that cheats. And they said, no one's ever going to believe he would cheat on you. So they, they and I was disappointed because, not that I wanted to play a nude scene. I, frankly, I didn't want to play a nude scene, but I knew that those scenes were very important for movies and my career. Not that I wanted to shoot a nude scene. And it was a really wonderful scene. So, I, you know, I was a little bummed out, but uh, it worked out fine in the end. So there you go. Do you think, because you have this enormous likable quality, that you haven't yet, you haven't played that big evil role that you'd like to play? Yeah, it's, it's always, it's <laughs> the ca don't casting see. wise, yeah. Yeah, they yeah, don't see that. Yeah, definitely. That's why sometimes theater offers uh, something you can do that's, you know, where you can play that more and you, you can get those parts, so. Right. Good. Okay, I think that uh, this, I'm being told that this is it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much for coming. And thank you to Anne, thank you. Thank you for doing the show. I loved it. Thank you all very much Thank for coming. You. It was great. <laughs>